Welcome to the Graduate Student Seminar Series, Tailoring Your Resume, presented by the Center for Career and Professional Development. We are located on the third floor of Hendricks Student Center on the main campus. We can also be found online at career.clemson.edu and on social media at Clemson CCPD. The Center for Career and Professional Development, or CCPD for short, is comprised of three units, the Michelin Career Center, the University Professional Internship and Co-op Program, also known as UPIC, and the Cooperative Education Program. As a graduate student, your interaction with the CCPD will be through the Michelin Career Center, as the other two programs are for undergraduate students. Through the Michelin Career Center, we offer career and major counseling, workshops, career fairs, networking events, employer events, and recruiting services. All of our services are available to you as a graduate student as part of your student fees, and after graduation, we also serve alumni for one year. You can see in our mission statement that the word empower is highlighted. Our goal as a center is to teach you the skills that are needed to be successful for a lifetime, whether that is resume writing, interviewing, networking, obtaining professional experience and, and a great work ethic, and much more. Statistics show that people will have 10 to 15 different jobs during their career. Our goal is to teach you the skills necessary to be successful in that environment. Remember the proverb, if you teach a man to fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he eats for, the, for a lifetime. That is our philosophy in the center. During this workshop, you will learn, one, the definition and use of a resume, two, the progression of developing a resume, three, general formatting guidelines, and four, the art of tailoring your resume to specific positions. The advice we give today is useful for everyone, but we want you to remember that there is no one perfect way to write a resume. If you ask 10 people to review your resume, you may see 20% of the responses match and then get an additional 10 pieces of individual advice. Your job is to take all of that advice and decide what is best for your personal brand. You will need to write a separate resume for each position you apply to. However, some of the information will be interchangeable. If you have what we call an everything but the kitchen sink document or a master template resume, then you can quickly copy and paste information into new resumes. This advice is general to all industries. However, you should consult with your faculty, um, any mentors you have, and any professionals you may know to see if they have any field-specific advice for you. Finally, your resume should be a self-promotional branding piece that sells your experience and the impact you can have on the company. If you need to explain your resume, then you need to rewrite it. The interview will allow you to expand on your experience, but the resume has to give them enough information to want to bring you in the door. So, what is a resume? It is generally the first impression you will make with a recruiter. Consider it the centerpiece of your brand. What does it tell a recruiter about you? You want to highlight, to highlight your education, relevant work experience, impact you have made during those experiences, your skills, and more. We will talk about optional sections later on in this workshop. It is used for a multitude of reasons, but generally to apply for positions, to apply to admission to graduate school, for scholarships or fellowship applications, for grant applications, and other similar reasons. It is a marketing tool. You need to use this document to stand out from others and make that recruiter want to call you for an interview. The first document you create is what we call the everything but the kitchen sink document. You can also refer to this as your master template document. For this document, you're going to brainstorm everything you have done. Education, work, volunteer activities, projects, presentations, publications, uh, organizational membership, and so on. The length of this document does not matter, so put everything in it. For ease of use when tailoring future resumes, enter all of the information in the same format that you are going to use on the version that is given to the employer. Edit for spelling and grammar so that you can simply copy and paste into the tailored document. 
Make sure you update this every semester, and once you graduate, update it at least every six months so that you do not forget important experiences. From this document, you are going to tailor resumes for each position. You may be wondering, what is tailoring and how do you decide what is relevant? Well, look at the position description. We suggest printing a copy of the position description and then reading it very carefully, looking for clues as to what is most important to the company. Are they repeating words? Do they have basic and preferred qualifications sections? Are they asking for experience with a specific task, software, or piece of equipment? Highlight, underline, circle, whatever your preferred method is, all of those items that seem very important in this position description. Then go back to your everything but the kitchen sink document and review it for all of the positions and experiences that, you sh that show you have that particular experience. Copy and paste those sections to a new resume. We will talk about formatting and additional sections that you can use later on. In this step, you are just looking to demonstrate that you have the qualifications necessary to be successful in the position. If you don't tell them, no one will. Think about this process as eating at a salad bar. If you grab a plate and add every single item from the salad bar, all three lettuce types, every topping, all seven different salad dressings, you're going to have an overflowing plate. That is your everything but the kitchen sink document. You would never give that to an employer. There is no way they will spend time weeding through all of that information looking for the pieces that fit their position. Instead, from that document, you will pick and choose the relevant experiences and information for each specific position every time. Another way to tailor your resume is to use the language or keywords from the position description in your resume for that company. Consider company A's job where it uses the word teamwork five times in the position description. Now consider company B's job where it uses the word collaboration several times. Probably an important skill both companies are looking for in the perfect candidate, right? For the resume for company A, you want to make sure you have used the words team or teamwork multiple times in your resume. For company B, change the wording to collaborate or collaboration. Seems silly and insignificant? Let me tell you why it isn't. Most companies use what is called applicant tracking software as the initial screening of resumes. Companies will enter keywords from the position description as filters for the resume. If team is a keyword filter and it never appears on your resume, you won't even make it to the next step even if you have plenty of teamwork experience. The computer is not interpreting your experience like a recruiter would. It is simply looking for exact words or phrases. Another reason why this is important is when your resume does get in front of, of a recruiter, you are lucky if they spend 10 seconds reviewing it. In those 10 seconds, they are mentally looking to check the box as a qualification. Does he have this? Does she have that? If so, you move on in the process to when they will spend more time reviewing your resume. Employers like to see that you have a basic understanding of their company culture. By using their language with them, it gives them that feeling. You can create area-specific resumes and then tailor each one of those. For example, if you are looking for research jobs and management jobs, you would be highlighting different experiences in each of those categories. Okay, so let's get into formatting the, re the resume. Master students can have two pages. PhD students can have three, pre p three pages. Recruiters are still happy with seeing a one-page document from both levels, though, if you do have one page. You want to fill the page and keep the eye moving from left to right and down the page. Researchers have concluded from retinal scans that when a recruiter's eye goes across and down the page, that those resume, resumes tend to move forward in the process in higher numbers than resumes that just have the eye scanning down the page. You can see on this slide that we placed a picture on the right hand side. That balances the slide and has your eye move across the content and down. Margins can be from a half an inch to one inch, 
equal on all sides. So it has to be in half an inch, top, bottom, left, and right, or one inch, top, bottom, left, and right, or anything in between. Your name should be the largest item on the page. We suggest 14 to 16 point font. Anything larger and you're going to get into what we call an ego font size. You should also only use standard fonts on your resume. Anything else on the page other than your name should be a 10 to 12 point font. And you can see that we have some standard fonts listed here on the, on the slide and you can see that each font takes up a different amount of space on the page. You do want to avoid anything that looks like handwriting or is cursive. Standard fonts are easily read by the human, human eye as well as those applicant tracking software systems that I spoke about a minute ago. You can see from this um, slide, again, that it's taking up different amounts of space on the page. You can choose the one that best fits your design preference. If you are using a multiple page resume, you have to fill at least the half of the second or third page. If you are not, you can use the margin, the font size, and the font type tricks to either expand or contract the information to fill the pages. On pages two and or three of your resume, you need to add your name and the page numbers on the header in case the pages separate when your resume gets printed by an employer. Let's get into each section now. The first section of the resume is the heading. This should include your name and the best contact information for you. It is fine to include both a current and a permanent address. For those of you that have a residence in an area where you plan to work after graduation, adding that additional residence on the resume lets an employer know that you are already familiar with the area and are willing to move. On the downside, they may not be willing to pay relo relocation fees since you already have an established residence in the area. Some employers are now suggesting that you only list the city and state of residence and not your street address. It helps protect your privacy and that level of detailed information is not needed by the company until an offer is extended and accepted. Only list one phone number and make sure it has a professional voicemail set up. If you are not sure what yours sounds like, call yourself. What impression are you giving an employer? Replace the message if necessary, especially if, if it is the robotic voice that just lists your phone number. Employers want to know that they are leaving the message at the right phone number and hearing your name is comforting for them. We suggest using your Clemson email on your resume. However, if you do not regularly use that email, you can use a private email address. Make sure it is a professional email Typically, your name with at Gmail or at another um, email provider. If your email is something like hotgirl25 at gmail.com, do not use that. What impression are you giving the employer? Not a good one. You can add a LinkedIn URL if you have the short personalized URL. If you have a website that showcases your work, or you have an account on websites for your industry that showcase your work, you can add that information here in the heading section. The objective statement is, op is optional. When we ask employers, we get a 50-50 response on whether they like to see it or not. If you use one, though, you must tailor it to each position. Our suggestion is to use the format that is listed in the example. So, for example, to obtain and then enter the position title, in this example, Assistant Manager in Advertising. At, enter company name, in this example, Marketing Corporation. That utilizes my, and then pick applicable skills that you have from that position description. In this example, Data Analysis, Communication, and Project Management Experience. The benefits of adding an objective statement is that it is the simplest form of tailoring. If you have the position title and company name listed on the resume, the employer knows you took at least one step towards customization. By including skills from the position description, you are also potentially adding keywords to your resume. If you do not have the space, though, on the resume, you can leave it off and then utilize the cover letter for this purpose. 
Education should always be listed on the resume, and it is usually the first section after the objective if the objective is used. Once you have an established career, you can consider moving it later in the resume. This section should include every degree you have completed or have in progress. Graduate degree first, then bachelor's degree. And you do want to write the degree in long form, not abbreviated. So in this example, Master of Science rather than MS. You're going to include the date of graduation, but not the start date of the degree. You can use the word anticipated or expected with the future date if you, if you prefer, although it's not always necessary. You're going to have the institution and the location of the institution because not everyone knows where every college is located. If you have a cognate, an emphasis, a concentration, you had a minor at any point, you can add that along with your degrees. And then your GPAs uh, can be listed if it is a 3.0 or higher. You can see an example on the slide here. If you prefer the university to be, to be listed first, you can flip those two lines. And this shows a good uh, example of filling the page, as mentioned earlier, and keeping the reader's eye going from left to right and down the page. The experience section is where you really tell your story. It can include professional experience, internships, class projects, volunteering, research, service, anything that will prove that you have the necessary experience for this position. Resumes are written in reverse chronological order, meaning the newest experience is first and then you work backwards. So what do you do when your most relevant experience is three jobs ago? This is when splitting your resume into multiple categories is very beneficial for tailoring your resume to each position. For example, you could have relevant experience and other work experience sections. The positions can then be reordered, bringing the most relevant job first into the relevant experience section, and then list the other positions in reverse chronological order in the other work experience section. You can have multiple positions in each category, but they will be newest to oldest in each category. Another example could be to split up your positions into functional experience areas, such as software engineering experience and management experience. As the example on the slide shows, you're going to include the position title, the company name and location, and the length of time in the position. For the dates, my suggestion is to include the month and year rather than just listing years. For example, if you list 2016 to 2017, it could mean two months of experience, so you were there December 6, 2016 and January 2017, or two years of experience. You worked there from January 2016 to December 2017. You want to be accurate and clear on your resume. Also, make sure you are consistent in your use of abbreviations with the dates and locations. If you abbreviate a month in one section, you need to abbreviate that month in all sections. Same goes for abbreviating states. Either it's the abbreviation throughout the resume or it's the entire name throughout. You will then add bulleted statements highlighting your experience, skills, responsibilities, and impact made. Changing the order of the bullets for each resume so that the most important experience is listed first is another method for tailoring your resume to the position. Let's go into more detail about the bulleted statements. Avoid writing complete sentences. If you are applying for positions in academia, paragraphs are okay, but industry does prefer bullets. Please refer to our CV workshop to learn more about applying to academic positions. Recruiters want to be able to skim your resume quickly looking for keywords and experience, and bullets will help them do that. You choose the number of bullets for each experience based on the position description. For example, I have social media responsibilities in this position, which is not common for career counselors to have. If I am applying for a position that requests social media experience, I'm going to make sure that appears in my bulleted list, probably as the first or second bullet. If the position doesn't list social media as a responsibility, 
I may leave that off completely and focus my attention on other skills that are wanted by that particular position. This is when the everything but the kitchen sink document is helpful. You may have 15 bullet points for each job on that document that you can then pick and choose from for your tailored resume. If your experience is project related, especially class projects, you're going to avoid writing overall project descriptions and instead focus in on what you learned, what impact you had, and what skills you gained. You can describe the project in more detail during an interview. On the resume, the recruiter is only interested in how that project taught you a skill or gave you experience that will be useful to the position for which you are applying. What should you focus on in these bulleted statements? You should be focusing on proving to the recruiter that you have the experience and skills necessary to be successful in the position. Play up your transferable skills if you do not have direct experience. For example, if they want someone with management experience and you have not supervised staff but were a team leader on a project, then discuss the leadership skills gained from that experience. Those skills are transferable to supervising staff. Each bulleted statement will begin with a strong action verb. Past tense for jobs that are completed, present tense for current jobs you are, you are in. Remember, you are not writing complete sentences. You are, you are also going to use a variety of verbs. It is very easy to find yourself reusing the same verb, like managed or assisted, but avoid it as much as possible. You want to showcase your, showcase your skills, and using a wide range of verbs can help do that. Try to be specific in your experience and use quantifiers when possible. For example, which is the stronger bulleted statement? Option one. Managed a budget of $1 million and introduced cost-saving measures that reduced budget overrides by 5%. Or, option two, manage my department's budget. By adding quantifiers, you give context to your experience. Although budget management pr principles stay the same no matter the amount of money, handling $1 million is certainly different than handling $500. Do not embellish. Um, you want to display your integrity and ethics by being truthful and describing your qualifications. If you are hired because you said you could do something, then you better be able to do it. Always check your spelling and grammar. Even one mistake can land your resume in the no pile of some recruiters. Resumes are formal documents and should be your best writing, so avoid informalities, slang language, and abbreviations. The only time abbreviations are acceptable is when it is an industry standard and everyone understands the abbreviation. NACE is the National Association of Colleges and Employers and they conduct surveys asking employers to rank the top skills they seek in new college hires. From this chart you can see that soft skills and transferable skills are the top six skills with the technical knowledge related to the job coming in at number seven. Make sure you are highlighting those types of skills on your resume in the context of your experience. Employers tell us all the time that they can teach the technical knowledge, but they can't teach someone to work well with others or to be organized. This is where the CCPD and the university are hoping to step in. Hopefully you have seen our nine core career competencies and the Learn, Act, Flex, Succeed cycle. There has been a lot of press about the skills gap, meaning employers do not believe college students are learning the necessary skills to be successful in the world of work. We here at Clemson believe it is more of an articulation of skills gap rather than students actually lacking the necessary skills. In an effort to help you understand what skills are important, we have developed these nine core competencies based on NACE's definition of career readiness and their core competencies. All events and resources from the center will be devoted to helping um, you as a student understand, acquire, and articulate these nine competencies. Think about them as the what we want you to learn and the learn, act, flex, succeed cycle as the how. You start by learning something new, trying out what you learned, flexing if it fails and looking for a new way until ultimately you reach success. 
Our nine core competencies focus mostly, mostly on transferable skill areas, where while your previous jobs are focusing more on the technical or task-oriented skills. You should be highlighting both types of experiences on your resume as they tell your full story. Companies are looking for fit. What do you bring to the table that will make a positive impact on the company right away? And discussing both types of skills helps to do that, as well as tailoring your resume to that specific position. We have focused a lot on experience so far, but there are additional ways that you can highlight your fit at the company, and that is through some of these additional resume categories. This slide shows popular extracurricular activities and honors that appear on a resume. You can include activities from your undergraduate years. For example, we've got fraternities and sororities listed on here. But remember to use reverse chronological order so that the graduate level and current activities appear first. If you are running out of room on your resume, you can just focus on the graduate level activities. At this point in your career, absolutely nothing from high school should appear on your resume. Some graduate students and seasoned professionals prefer to use a summary of qualifications section instead of an objective statement. Um, these can serve the same purpose, summarizing key information, skills, and experience that you have that match the job for which you are applying. Some choose to put in their summary of qualifications um, their particular interest area. So maybe it is also labeled a research interest area. It helps to tell your story to the employer. You're going to pick and choose additional sections that are relevant to the job um, position that you're applying for. If you are looking for a technical position, having computer skills um, is paramount on your resume. If you are looking for a position within a global company, then language skills and or an intercultural experience section um, are very important to showcase not only that you have language skills, but also the competency and desire to work in a diverse organization. As a graduate student, you may have presented research findings or published articles in journals. Those activities demonstrate communication skills to employers. Using columns is a space-saving measure for some of these sections. So you can see the computer skills, we put them in three columns to take up less space than if we had used a bulleted list. Here are some links to some career spot videos about resume writing. These are located on the resources page of our website. So it's career.clemson.edu slash resources.php. Ch uh, check these out when you have time. They are short but very useful. I have discussed throughout the workshop the importance of tailoring your resume. This slide is a good summary of the why and how. The bottom line is that you customize your resume to show that you are a qualified applicant and the best fit for the position. Sending a generic resume will not do that. As we wrap up, let's review. Take your resume and hold it up to a friend for a couple seconds and then take it down. What is their first impression? Did they think it looked neat and professional? Consider their feedback when making revisions. Consistency is key. All jobs in a section should be formatted the same way. If you abbreviate the state in the education section, then abbreviate the state in the experience section. Check for spelling, grammar, and wording errors. This is where you can show attention to detail. If you turn in a sloppy resume, you are not going to get the job. Have someone else read it for errors. When you've looked at it a hundred times, you are going to miss things. Is the information relevant to the job? Did you customize? Remember, every document should be unique. Earlier, I introduced the career core competencies and stated that the center is focusing on helping students gain and articulate um, these competencies. This workshop that you're participating in focuses specifically on the competencies of communication, self-awareness, brand, and integrity and ethics. 
If you need more help, you can find us on the third floor of Hendricks Student Center on the main campus, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30, or online at career.clemson.edu, or social media at Clemson CCPD. Give us a call at 864-656-6000, or to make an appointment, call 864-656-0440. If you're ready to put this knowledge to use, check out our career fairs and other workshops and events. Our fall career fair is generally held in September, and the spring career fair is generally held in late January or early February. We do offer some industry-specific career fairs as well. Check out our event page for exact dates and more information about all of our upcoming events and services. On this side, you see our full offering of services and programs available to you as a graduate student, and this is part of your student fees that you pay. There is no additional charge to use any of these services. During the fall and spring semesters, we offer drop-ins Monday through Friday from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m., or excuse me, 1.30 to 4 p.m. Please see our website for our summer hours. These are for quick questions and they last 10 to 15 minutes. They are a great opportunity to talk briefly to a career counselor about one topic of interest. During the fall and spring semesters, we offer appointments Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon and 1.30 to 4 p.m. See our website for our summer hours. These are great when you need to talk to a career counselor about multiple topics or would like to spend more time discussing one topic. You must call ahead for an appointment and they last 30 or 60 minutes depending on the topic. For example, our mock interviews last 60 minutes. Thank you for viewing our workshop. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call us at 864-656-6000 or come in for drop-ins or an appointment. Thanks.